Hello and welcome to the Atelier Forum podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to a phenomenal artist. His name is Nicholas Uribe. In this episode, Nicholas shares his insights about how he deals with the art market, specifically how he's circumvented galleries and uses a direct-to-consumer model. In addition to that, and this is really important for all of us artists out here trying to make it in the real world, he talks about how he engages on social media and how to make those platforms work better for you. And really quick, before we jump into this conversation, if you want to get in touch with the show with questions or comments, you can email theatelierforum at gmail.com. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy the show. This is my conversation with Nicholas Uribe. I've been sort of training myself for the last, I don't know how many years, but realizing that things happen and you, you know, you may have everything that you can do that is in your power to do everything right and to make everything perfect. And then there's certain things that will just put everything in chaos that have no, you know, you have no control over. And you kind of have to deal with that. And that's okay. I think that that's part of very much so life. But but I think that because us artists are very, I think we're very fragile. I think that what we do is very, very fragile. Like we live in a place where things can go right and it can be great and where things can go wrong and you can be like, mm. oh my God, I haven't made money in the last like two years. So, you know, I haven't sold anything in the last 10 years. That's real, it, talk. We live, That's real talk. Yeah. <laughs> we live in that fine line where it's just, yeah. it's a matter of like luck or just things just falling into place perfectly. Mm. And it just seems so arbitrary at times. I've, I've noticed it because I think we've talked about this, but I'm I'm sure we both know of people and we've both had probably moments in our lives where we haven't done well. But mm -hmm. I my heart breaks when I see people that work 10 times harder than I do and mm -hmm. they are struggling. Like yeah. That's when you realize, oh, this this world is not fair. Like the world mm -hmm. is not fair, the art world is not fair. It just doesn't for as much as as we feel that people love art, like you know, humanity loves art and protects mm. art. Like it's been very telling to see all the, um, all the kind of like illustrators, pre-production art community, like going out and saying, we don't like the current AI models. We don't like AI. And, yeah. and just a lot of people, you know, beautifully coming together and saying like, no, we have to protect this beautiful thing that is art. Um, for as much as that is true, you realize that we don't quite live in a society that that kind of takes care of artists. We don't, we really, really don't. Mm -hmm. um, we have this idea that an artist should be strong. Like, it's almost like very Darwinian. Like, you have to be very strong. And if not, then, you know, the art world is just going to spit you out. Like, you're not just, you're not going to be worthy. You don't have the mental fortitude. It, it's It's that kind of cutthroat. And mm -hmm. it's kind of sad because there are so like, I have no idea how a profession that um, seems to be, again, so fragile, uh, people losing their jobs constantly. I have friends that work in like video game industries or animation industries, and they think they have a great job. And then suddenly it's like, oh, our show got canceled or, oh, our video game got, you know, mm -hmm. our studio got swallowed up by another studio. And now I don't have a job. Like you know, at, at, at like, you know, at a second's notice. Mm -hmm. But so it's very, it's really weird that we live in a world where those things are ubiquitous and yet more and more and more people study art. And like, mm -hmm. you know, the private universities that teach art are some of the most expensive places that you can, you know, get an education on earth. It's just so strange to me that whole, like when you look at the art world as a whole, there's so many things that make no sense that make absolutely yeah. no sense. And yet here we are like, you know, more and more people just willing to put everything on the line and, and, and make, you know, these enormous um, kind of life changing risks, take life changing risks because they understand that, you know, whatever type of art it is, you can, you can be composing something or you want to dance or you want to be in theater or you want to make a sculpture, or you want to draw or paint, whatever it is, like you just have this pull that says, no, that's what I have to do in my life. And it's very, very strange. Mm -hmm. I, I think that 
when you are in this, you know, that can be like the, at the beginning of your, of your life as an artist, where, where you have to like answer to those things. I think that that's very encouraging, but once you go through that stage and once you're like thrown into real world of art and you realize how, how horribly difficult it is, I think into what you were saying about trying to be a perfectionist, I think you quickly realize that you have to be flexible. You have to be enormously flexible and you, you have to like put your ego away many times. You know, it's not about, Oh, I, you know, this is, this is my work. This is what I want to paint. And I'm never going to alter it or change it for anyone. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just going to do whatever I do until people throw money at my face. Like you kind of have to adjust that attitude because that may work for very extraordinary yeah. people in extraordinary mm -hmm. cases. But the reality of the art world is that you better learn how to be like adaptive and, and, mm -hmm. and just lenient and uh, tolerant and mm -hmm. just, you know, morph into a thousand things that maybe you weren't expecting, but that can make this ride like super exciting also. So yeah. I thought of myself, I thought I would be a gallery painter. You know, if if you ask 20 year old me, I thought right now I would be in, you know, forum gallery, maybe, you know, that that my life's work would be just striving to get into that gallery. And, you know, I would tell myself, well, I'm 20 now, but if I give myself 25 years, like I can get into that gallery. Like that would be, I thought that was going to be mm -hmm. me, you know, a painter that was showing in a big kind of figurative slash, you know, realist sort of naturalist gallery and selling paintings for hundreds of thousands of dollars, because that's what I thought like successful artists, you know, would do. That was my mm -hmm that to me was like oh yeah when you're there like yeah you're good you've made it like you have proven yourself to be a, a you know a great painter but mm -hmm. you know flash forward i'm you know i i'm a youtuber with my partner so that's i but yeah. i feel like there's there's like this great new middle class uh, yeah. artist and I, and I don't mean middle class in the sense that like you know oh, you're an artist and you scrape by but i'm saying like people making middle class careers in art right whereas i feel like there was always before that it was kind of an industry of like giants and midgets right, right? like there yes. were there were a few people that did incredibly well mm -hmm. and then everybody else you know ate you know at right. the bottom like tr trying to become one of those those people that did really really uh, uh, incredibly well because there was no like uh like direct to consumer model you know right like you, right. you almost like like an actor, you had to wait to be cast in the movie for anybody to know you exist. Right. Whereas like that whole paradigm shifted and with it, I think emerged this enormous group of people that were like, well, if I just find the thing that works for me, you know, it became more uh, of a, or sorry, less of like a one size fits all career. And I think right. that's one of the coolest things that's happened like in the last 15 years. Yeah, no, you're, you're a hundred percent right. Even like, what when I was younger were apparently accessible galleries. Like I remember Eleanor Eleanor Eleanor, Eleanor Edinger in New York being mm -hmm. like a an accessible what you thought was an accessible gallery. Um, you know, I, even that getting there seemed very far away because Edinger was a place where you would see art for five thousand dollars. It wasn't the 50,000 that you would see in, in forum. So, you know, same size painting could be 12,000 and 150,000 in, in forum. So it was that much of a difference. It was like 10% of the prices that you could get, you know, in a bigger gallery. So, but even there, even, even there at, at that gallery, I remember seeing, who did I see? I mean, Skip Lipke and Paul Oxborough, I think was there. Mm -hmm. Um, Steve Houston was there and that was amazing. But even for me, I would look at Steve Houston. And I would be like, yeah, I'm not that good right now. Like it's going to take me years and years to try to be that level. So even there, it was very, very like you very quickly noticed that, oh, wow, this is like a mid to entry level, nice, healthy gallery. And yet it feels really far away. And you never felt like you had a chance to 
to like show up there and say, oh, yeah, there's this like winter show or something that they're going to put up 2000 paintings on this wall and I'm going to be one of them. No, it never yeah. felt that way. Never really felt that way. And nowadays, yes, you know, there are there are smaller galleries that you can try to like, um, um, you know, get your career kind of jump started that, that, you know, in those places. What I would say is like, the sad thing about smaller galleries is that because they are smaller, because their prices are more accessible, they have to work with an enormous roster of artists. Like you can't have a small gallery selling pieces, all of them under two grand, let's say, or under 1500 and have 10 artists that you want to take care of. That doesn't work as a business. It just doesn't make sense. So they have 120 artists and you know, the the sad part of that or the sacrifice that you, you know, you quickly realize is being made is that you're not really going to have like a great relationship with that gallery because you are honestly one of 120. And if they don't sell your work, they'll just look at the people that they are selling very quickly. They'll turn to those mm -hmm. people very, very quickly. And they, you know, aside from it being like a storage problem, they won't, they don't mind if you just tell them, yeah, I'll send you more work and see if we can sell it. And they'll be like, yeah, fine, we can store it. Like, we, we'll just, you know, hope that we get a chance to sell it, but that's fine. If we don't, it's totally fine. But yeah. what I think those middle, those mid, like medium to small size galleries don't realize is that a lot of artists put all their eggs on, on that basket and say, no, I just send five paintings to this gallery and I'm hoping I can sell them because that was the last six months of my life or something like that. Yeah. And in our minds, it means I hope I can make the money or recover the money of those past six months, or I hope I can have money so that I can keep painting for the next six months. And I think galleries don't realize how, again, how fragile we are that we just yeah. need that. We we have we're like desperately needing that. I mean, you say that they don't realize. I don't even think that that's like on the menu of their list of things that they could realize because it's, it yeah. just doesn't apply. Like they right. they are taking in like on commission raw material that's made by X, Y, and Z human being, and and for them that that it's actually I have to say like it's a bit of a, a racket, you know, like you. You don't pay any production cost. Nothing. You could, you could like, if you're like a decent, you know, decent at like presenting yourself as like an interesting, useful facade. Like you could get as many artists as you wanted to like probably get to you to send you like two or three works. Yeah. So like you don't, you don't, you don't pay any of that. You don't, you don't pay to to ship it in. Um, all you do is like you you just try and like sell it. And if you sell it, that's you, it. You you skim that fifty yeah. percent off the top. Like it's it all it almost seems. How did how did we get to that place? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. is the question I keep asking myself. And then I thought I had this brief moment, this, this, <laughs> I want to call it lucid, but it was, it was perhaps like hallucinogenic. I thought like, <laughs> what if artists like unionized, you know, what if we, yeah. what if we said, we're not, no, we're not going to give you 50%. That's, that's extortionate for, yeah. for like the job that you do. You know, we collectively will agree, we will bargain to give yeah. you, you know, 30% you know, something that, you know, commiserate with your contribution to the process yeah. of, of production. Yeah, I always heard the argument of, do you know how rent, how expensive rent is for this, you know, place here in like, mm -hmm. whatever it was, first it was mm -hmm. Soho, and then it was Chelsea, or whatever, wherever a gallery was. Um, but I would always get that when I was talking to when I was able to like, you know, eventually know the uh, gallery directors. And, um, and they would just tell me how many works they would have to sell every month so in order to make rent mm -hmm. and um but that's like a i'm sorry but that's like a thing to throw in our faces it's like i don't want to know like i don't want to know your problems could you imagine me sitting here and just telling you how expensive my kids are like, what yeah. does that do? Like, what? Yeah. You, I'm sure the gallery director would immediately go, "Yeah, but your kids are your responsibility. Let's don't come at me with like mm -hmm. these things that, you know, that you have to take care of uh, when you, you know, when you sell a painting, when you get money from a painting." And in the same mm -hmm. sense, I would 
I would guess you could say, well, don't come at me with your rent because that's not my yeah. issue. My yeah. issue here is like, we're both going to work together in order to sell this. That's it. That's it. That's yeah. really it. And you have, you know, you believe you have access to people that I don't that can, you know, provide me with a market, with a larger market and, and you know, better prices that are, you know, again, and, and I guess your question, like, where do we get here? It's just that this idea that artists were always like this lower tier beings that we would never have access to like, you know, markets that would, you know, demand um, where our work would demand the prices that we think we deserved. So we always, we, I think we, we just started to believe, and I think we got lazy and we, we just said, yeah, no, they deal with it. And I just don't know people. I'm just like the scruffy, you know, little mm -hmm. piece of crap. And I just do my work, but they do the heavy lifting and they sell it to like rich people. And we always, I think, you know, years, decades um, went by where, or probably centuries went by where we just felt like, yeah, it's not my place. Like, this is not my mm -hmm. place. It's not my place to meet people or to get to know people or to try to sell my work directly to people. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I'm just a mess. I just don't know how to talk to people. I don't know how to dress. Yeah. I don't know how to do anything. It's like, no, 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 it's better. Like we're all better off if they deal with it. And I can understand that there's mm -hmm. people that have personalities that, you know, they do, just don't want to deal with it. They just, they just mm -hmm. say, look, I'm a terrible salesperson. I get yeah. very nervous when I talk to people. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot every single time I try to sell my painting. So that's where I need somebody, somebody else to do this for me because I'm a mess. And I totally yeah. understand that. But again, you know, I would say, and having gone through like this exercise that we've been through with, uh, with Danny for the last um, years, I'm not going to say it's easy to sell something. But once you realize that, that within your business, within your life as an artist, you also have to take care of trying to sell your work. Mm -hmm. And once you encounter that head on and you say, okay, this is my responsibility. As much as mm -hmm. like painting a painting is my responsibility, like trying to sell this and creating a market and trying to you know convince people that there is worth to what you know I do, that is my responsibility. I think we're very capable of doing that. We just don't think we are. We kind of believe that yeah. we're just idiots, you know, and it's I've gone self, through that. I'm I not... think it's a self-talk issue. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, and it's interesting when you started explaining this, the first thing you said is you, you described an inner monologue in which you said, I'm crap at selling things and I'm not good at yada, yada, yada. Like that's actually mm. where the, the disconnect starts is that you, right. you start by internalizing that idea that you are bad at it, that, that you yeah. can't tell. Like the fact of the matter is like, there's nobody more qualified to tell anybody about it than, than, than you are. You have this personality where I, I don't think you get hung up on starting things. You're willing right. to like break a barrier and just like do a thing. And if it, if you stumble, then like whatever you'll, you'll do the next thing. And I think it's, there's something in that attitude that's totally required. If you're going to like get anything done yes. yourself as an artist. Y you know what helped me? Like one, I remember one day I, and it took me one afternoon to quickly realize this, but I was like, let's examine our options. Like sit down, examine your options. So I had been teaching for, you know, 10, uh, like over 10 years, 12 years at a university that paid like at a fine arts faculty, a huge university that paid horribly. So that was like, my what I and what I understood is like okay that's my source of income which is horrible. You also have to acknowledge that as as horrible as the internet is and and it's horrible in many ways, mm -hmm. but in terms of the the socializing aspect and especially in terms of of this the the socializing of creative projects, it's incredible. It's absolutely yeah. incredible. Like you never know. Like somebody could put like a small animated short on YouTube. And it could change a kid's life, like, you know, the world across it, it yeah. could, they could see that and they could be like, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And maybe they, you know, start doing stop motion in their basement for seven years and they make like this incredible, you know, piece of work. Um, yeah. So, you know, that aspect is just, 
it's it's amazing. It's it's incredible. I remember, I don't know if we talked about this, but I remember the only way I knew of Ooglo when I was studying is because one of my teachers had a catalog mm -hmm. and they showed us a 12 page catalog of Ooglo. And I was like, who is this person? And, you know, I mean, th there was internet back then, but you would get like, you know, two pixel images, if any of, of like, yeah. and you wouldn't get a lot of information on Ooglo back in, you know, mid to late nineties. But, um, yeah. So that was the extent of socializing something that you had a teacher that was kind enough to want to share what they had, the information that they had compiled. And then, and then it was like this almost like religious experience for you saying like, wow, I had never seen that. But then it was like, for us, you know what we would do right next to our uh, painting uh, classroom, there was a room where we could do Xerox. Mm -hmm. So we had a big Xerox <laughs> machine, a color Xerox machine. And yeah. we would just go there and spend a couple of bucks and and just make color prints, like color Xeroxes of of whatever catalog and and um, whatever thing. I remember Steve Sell bringing like a fetch and drawing book. Um, no, 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 no. He brought photographs of some fetch and drawings because he had seen this book and it was somebody else's, and he had convinced this other person to lend him the book. And he had professionally had he had some people I, I don't know what was it called Jelly Bean I think it was called in New York at that time, it was a place that you would you know they were uh, specialized in 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 photography for art, and he would yeah. take you know he took that book in and they shot the book and he had prints mm -hmm. very beautiful photographs of the drawings, uh, in that book and I remember when he brought the photographs we were all like oh my god what is this like fetching who is this person. And he let us, like, he told us, okay, you can make Xeroxes, but just one each. Like, you can just grab one drawing, like one of these photos. So what we did with the friends was like, let's just all pick different ones. One one for, you know, one for um, each one of us. And then we'll make Xeroxes of the Xeroxes <laughs> so that we could trade them so that we could have more. And I still have in a portfolio in my mother's house, I still have like about, three or four like large uh, color Xeroxes of, of fetching. Yeah. So that is how I understood art to be socialized, you know, 25 years ago, which is nothing, you know, 25 yeah. years ago, it, it's nothing. And, mm -hmm. you know, cut to now where I just open my freaking Instagram every day and I'm floored. I'm constantly floored by, yeah. you know, a 17 year old girl that just picked up procreate like and is doing like this crazy character creation I, and I, it's it blows me away i i'm not um i don't think i've ever gotten used to that to just opening stuff i mean i i don't like instagram now because it's it's um it's kind of messy but but when you are able to access things that you know, that the algorithm tells you like, oh, you might like this because you like cool yeah. artwork. You might like this. When I have that sense of discovery of saying like, I don't know this person. I don't know, you know, I don't know their gender. I don't know where they're from. I don't know their yeah. religion, their belief system. I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care mm -hmm. the best of ways, like hoping that they're good people, you know, but, yeah. but, uh, and still say, I am moved by this. I'm completely moved mm -hmm. by this. That is amazing. So, in essence, that is the tool that we have. And I think that we are um, not dumb if we don't use it, but I think we are certainly overlooking something that can be of a great benefit to us if we don't use it properly. If, it, it, you know, if we just say, no, this is a crap social media platform. And it, of course it has tons of issues, tons of problems. Um, yeah. Like I have done that with Twitter, for example. I don't, I don't, like I have a Twitter account and I think I've posted like two things, um, yeah, like two paintings, but I just don't like Twitter. I don't, I don't like the, like if I'm scrolling through Twitter, I don't like the person that I start to become like this person mm -hmm. that's just insanely opinionated with things mm -hmm. that are completely irrelevant. Like every single comment. <laughs> yeah. Your life every, wouldn't change like yeah, at all. If you never thought about this stuff, every single comment yeah. is like, quickly becomes like the hill that you want to die in yeah. every single thing that any other person says is like, ah, well, actually I disagree because, 
then it's I just don't like being that person. I'm so yeah. much a better human being when I'm not that person, when I pick my battles and, you know, when I say, okay, that's, you know, there's an idiot there and I'm going to be tolerant. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. I came into the subway and there's this person just spewing nonsense. Like I can just decide, okay, I'm not going to, you know, care about this yeah. because it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and then you just, yeah. And then you just go about your day. But um, I think I'm a better person there. So there are platforms and and that you know that you have to decide how much you put into and 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 the mm -hmm. sort of person or persona that is your that is going to be in that platform. But um, but I think if you if you can use them wisely, and if you use them wisely, then they're a, they are of an immense aid, and they do open up the world to people, to people, people that you, you know, that you realize that. If you are willing to um, engage with people, but not not in a in a oh uh, you know this is a business and you know I have to engage. No, no, no. If you're willing to engage just because you want to talk to people, like get to know people, say hi yeah. to people, and just spend a couple of minutes, like you know, listening to what they have to say about their own work or about how your work impacted what they're doing and they maybe show you something that they're doing and you tell them how their work is like making you feel um about a work that you're working like a painting that you're doing right now like that like proper just regular human being engagement if you're willing to like spend a little bit of your time just saying well if i want real people to buy my work i you know I want to be surrounded by real people then. I want to get to know real people. And you also realize that because sometimes some people can mis misconstrue this and say, well, you know, the your real people are your potential market then and that's it. And it's like yes and no. I mean, it is a business. So you don't have to be shy about saying I depend on you. Like in a patron model, it's like this is only possible because of you. Yeah, like you have exactly. to quickly tell people none of this would make sense or be possible yeah, if it yeah. wasn't for you. So otherwise you would be somewhere else, you know, you know, flipping burgers or whatever, using right. some other skill that you might have and not yeah. spending time like making your artwork. Exactly. So I think, like one of the first things you have to get over fast. If you're going to be an artist, you're going to get out there and do your thing is the fact that like, it's also a small business. You're of also course. like a bakery or <laughs> I don't know. I was gonna say like a like a video rental shop, like like where of course, like, yeah, like thirty years ago, sure, but whatever. Like you're a small business, and you your 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 customers. It doesn't mean you don't care about people. I can tell this. I can talk about this from from like a super, you know, direct experience. But um, in the art school that I was teaching, very liberal art school, like usually you know art faculties are, um, mm -hmm. money was sort of demonized. You know, the the yeah. the market was very much so demonized. It almost felt like it it was an obstacle in the creative process. Like if you cared about that, then your actual intent was going to be morphed into yeah. something else. But yeah. that's BS. Like when I, I I'm very grateful that I went to SVA at the time that I did because all of our teachers were professionals, all of them. That was the one thing, and I think SVA still tries to do that. That if you are a teacher. It yes, you are in there for the for academic purposes, and you might love academy, and you might love you know conceptually what teaching means, but mm -hmm. it is imperative that you also reflect upon your students that you know what that bis that world looks like out there, that you yeah. know from firsthand experience that hey, when you graduate, this is what's going to happen, and you can tell them about it, you can talk to them about it, and they can actually see you you know, in your day to day, kind of act like this professional artist, whatever you might do. I am actually super grateful for that because it never, you know, my dream was always, I want to live from making what I love to do. That's mm -hmm. always what I had in my mind. I was like, the best scenario in my life is if I could make paintings and people could pay me for those paintings. Yeah. And it never felt weird and it never felt wrong and it never felt nasty and it never felt like it was, it, you know, all of a sudden it was going to destroy my creative output. Mm. 
um, mm-hmm. or my intent in some way. Never felt like that. It just yeah. it felt like an acknowledgement that this is the thing that I love to do. I would love to get paid for it. That's yeah. it. That really is it. So yes, like when you deal with like people and you have to have like this kind of open heart, open mind um, when when you have to encounter people in real life or, or um, if you're doing it through your social media platforms, yeah, you have to like genuinely want to talk to them mm-hmm. as human beings and treat them as human beings. But I think they also know it's like, I want to get to know you better because that'll give me a better like understanding of what you do. And I'm going to be more willing to buy something of yours if I have a better understanding. Like if I can not just picture you as this face, this avatar that paints these paintings, but as this person that has a voice, that has an attitude, Mm -hmm. that has a belief system that says dumb jokes or that, you know, says something stupid from time to time. Like if I can picture you flaws and all like warts and all good times, bad times. But if, if that's like an image that I can have in my brain, um, then it just, it means so much more to me. Yeah. I was um I was very very lucky to um cuz I never met him cuz he was he went to SVA but but um but way before I I went to SVA but when I um asked uh, John Paul Leon who's a comic book artist he's incredible when I asked him to do a commission for me like we you know we had like these super cool conversations uh, through through Instagram um and that was my way of like knowing you know, this person that I always admired from, from afar and that, you know, it was heartbreaking because he, I didn't know of this. I I knew he, he was sick. I didn't know the extent, um, as -hmm. to, you know, how sick he was, but, um, you know, to know that he was very sick and he was still doing like this Batman piece for me, this, you know, drawing for me, Mm -hmm. um, that's, which is absolutely incredible. Also, it's like super committed. It, it it never felt like, oh, you know, I'm sick. I'm just going to half-ass this. Like such mm-hmm. a level of like commitment, professionalism, everything. And him being like sweet enough and like, you know, wanting to talk to me at that moment. And then he, you know, passed uh, some months afterwards. I was like, okay, this is like, this is tough. This is tough because mm-hmm. that's kind of the experience. I mean, not the outcome because I wish the world would have had like his talent for, you know, eternity because he was such a good like drafts person. Mm. But, um, but that's what you want. Like ultimately you want that tiny little bit of, you know, moment with a, with an artist that you can say, I had like, I got to know them at this point. And when I look at the drawing that I have of his, I'm just reminded of all of that. I'm reminded of how talented he is. I mean, that's unavoidable, but I'm reminded of, of like, wow, you know, he had, he could have just said no to a commission. You know, this is probably like, I forget how much it was. Like, let's say it was like a thousand dollar commission or something like that, but he could have just said, no, I'm sure he was fine. I'm sure he was totally fine with, you know, in terms of money. And he could have just said like, no, I'm, you know, it's not my best moment sorry, I'm just not accepting stuff. And, and he was just so kind with me that, um, that I was like, woof, you know, that's, that's the type of like connection and the type of person that you want to meet when you say, I'm, I want to talk to this artist, or I want to have an idea of who this artist is on the other side, you know, and it's going to make art just feel so much more valuable to me, but not in terms of money, but just like, you know, when I walk, we have like actual a, value, like value that, um, that you yeah, want value in that, life, that, experiences exactly. you want to have. Exactly. I feel like you've, you've always been like at a really incredible, I mean, as far as I've, I've seen, we've had two conversations in like uh, uh, ever, but as far as like I've known you through your social media, like you've always really been a champion of that. And I think it's, it's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you in the first place is just as I feel like uh, I feel like I've gotten to know you a bit, actually, with, with how open you are and how... Um, how thoughtful you are about the like how much of yourself you share on yeah. online i mean everybody kind of chooses where their boundary is you know and i feel yeah. like you've yeah, been it- a lot more of like an open book about that 
That's all for the show this time around. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman. And if you want to find out more about what Nicholas Uribe is getting up to, you can check the show notes at stephenbaumanartwork.com slash podcasts slash Atelier Forum podcast. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I will see you in the next episode where we're talking to another really great professional. His name is Adrian Gottlieb, and that will be out as soon as we can get everything edited.